Thank you so much for coming. Good afternoon, and uh, welcome to the 10th um, in the Archives Public Lecture Series. I'm so glad you guys are here. A um, couple of notes uh, for those of you who don't know. We're setting up an archive. Um, this is the archives at NCBS, uh, and we're trying to set it up as a nodal center for looking at the history of contemporary biology in India. Um, uh, do save the date. We should be open the first week of February, so uh, we'll, we'll send out a notification regarding that. And um, this lecture series is one way in which we're just trying to get the community together and uh, discuss uh, things, history, science, and such. So uh, I'm thrilled um, that Gisela is here today, and uh, thanks to Janvi and Roland who appointed me to, uh, to her. So um, by way of an introduction, uh, Gisela Matias um, is a full professor at the Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México. Uh, she's been there since 2003. Her main research interest is the history of 20th century physics, particularly in Mexico. Some of her last publications in collaboration with her colleague Edna Suarez Diaz are Clouds, Airplanes, Trucks, and People, Carrying Radioisotopes to and Across Mexico. This was in 2016. And Atoms for Peace in Latin America, uh, Latin American History, uh, in the Oxford Research Encyclopedia. She's currently working on a joint project with Edna Suarez Diaz on the relationship between development, technical assistance, and the peaceful applications of atomic energy in Mexico. Please give it a wall, Michael. Thank you so much, Pinkat, for inviting me, and thank you to everybody to be here at the talk. Well, I, I'm sure that many of you are not familiar, very familiar about what went on in Mexico, but, well, this is a good occasion to maybe to be near to it. So the name of my talk is Pacifying Atoms, the Mexican case to be or not to be nuclear. Now we will find out why I say to be or not to be nuclear during the, from the 50 to 1970. So just to make, I will begin, I, I just will talk a little bit about, about what was going around in Latin America during that period and to get into the history of science. So. When I would like to talk to you very quickly, when my colleague Edna and I started to work on this topic, we realized that most of the history of science in Latin America had a predominance of national history of science, so we, we tried just to avoid some of them, and, and that the history of science had been dominated by the central periphery dichotomy, and that comes from spheres of development and dependency, so we really tried to think about a, a transnational way of, of writing down this history of science in Latin America, and in particular, the history of science in Mexico. Also, we, there was, this is almost like eight years ago, there was a, a huge absence of Cold War regional students in the history of science. And also, there's a general problem that is, what's the meaning of Cold War in Latin America? But I'm not going to talk about this today, but well, that point that at some moment we had to address because the Cold War is not the same everywhere, okay? So actually in Latin America, the Cold War began in the middle of the 50s. So just to give you a sense of, to begin in Mexico and of periodization, uh, in Mexico there was a very important muralist movement that took place from the 30s to the end of the 50s, and one of the main uh, painters was Diego Rivera. Uh, many, of you, many of you should know he was, Frida Kahlo was her partner for many years. And well, he, he painted this beautiful era, but what is interesting is how science and the atom began to appear in his, in his mirror and the idea of modernization as industrialization, okay? Although all this combined with indigenous, the indigenous past, I mean, it's a little bit syncretic, but it's a new way of looking of, at modernity in Mexico. Well, so what was going on on post-war Latin America during the 50s? I use post-war because the Second World War had to do in many places with many changes, but to talk especially to the Anglo school, okay? So 
I will tell you, there was this nation building all around Latin America. There was a profound entanglement between what was seen as development, modernity, and nationalism that, as we will see, it was quite different than every place. And there was this huge discourse uh, of development as economic growth, as Rosso has stated before. It had to do with industrialization. And this non-problematic transfer of science and technology that would, be, that would be the best way to solve all the problems of development around the third world. Also, there was a, this nationalism was seen as a protection of internal markets, and there was a huge natural resource sovereignty. So in particular in Mexico, this is going to be very important since our biggest border is with the United States of America. So it's important to know that, and that shaped in many ways what happens to the nuclear history in Mexico. And also, nationalism and development interests were aligned at some point and conflicted at others as happened in every part. So, there are these two main questions that motivate the research. And one of them is, in which ways are the practices of Mexican science inserted in the international national, to talk about this tension, context of Cold War science and technology? And we found out during our research that, of course, the international agencies, particularly the technical agencies from the United Nations system, were really, really crucial for the movement of people, instruments, and knowledge, and this as part of the process of standardization of scientific practices during this period. So, when Venkat invited me to give this talk, she said if I could make some reflection about the archive. And I think it's very important at this point to make it, because how can we answer the questions we are making? And of course, with the archives, there's no way to do it. There are many kinds of archives, but in particular, we, we made this search in national and international archives. I will tell you briefly that in Mexico, we don't have a tradition on having national archives well organized. Actually, we throw away almost all the papers, so it's quite a problem, but we have some. And although they are not very well organized, they are useful. So we have this historical archive at the UNAM that is very important. It's Science and technology has been done primarily in, at UNAM during the, from the 40s, 50s until now. Then what we call the National General Archive that concentrates all the documents from the history of Mexico. And I, I can tell you that half of it is not organized, so it's used, you cannot use it at all. And well, but you can find some things there if you are very patient. And also we have the Foreign Ministry Archive that now it's being organized, so you can find some things. And we have one of the most important physicists in Mexico during the 40s and 50s, the Manuel Santos. Yes. And his archive was organized. So actually it's very funny because when he died, his wife uh, wanted to give the archive to the Physics Institute at, the, at UNAM, and the Physics Institute said, no, thank you. I mean, why would we like to have Sandoval Vallejo's archive? It's too much paper. So they rejected the archive, and it was sent to another university. But well, there it is, and it's very use, useful to have it. And at the international level, we found, no, and everybody finds, at the National Archives and Record Administration in Washington, the NARA archive, one can find a lot of things around the world. <laughs> and actually, we have found many things from Mexico there that we don't have in Mexico. So it's always a place you have to go and look, although you have to be very conscious how the archive is organized and for what purpose it is organized. So, but it's crucial to see, to look at this NARA archive for making 20 history of science. And in our case, there is an, a very nice archive named named the Michigan Memorial Phoenix Project, that it's in Ann Arbor at the University of Michigan. 
And for Mexico, it's very important because many Mexicans were to study during the 50s to Ann Arbor, and they were funded by this Memorial Things project. And also, a very important archive now, it's the International Atomic Energy Agency archive in Vienna. It's organized, they haven't finished yet with everything. Actually, the archivists don't, there's one really good archivist, but the other ones really don't know how to to suggest things, for example. But it's very important if you're trying to do history of nuclear science in the world. So just to let you know where we have been working. And with this archive, we have done almost, almost all our work. So let's go, let's go in, to Mexico. So in Mexico, modernity and development were understood in very, very similar ways to I have shown you about Latin America. And we have this national sovereignty over natural resources, uranium for instance, just to say that we don't have good uranium, so actually we never mine uranium. There was a huge plan, but it never happened. And this national sovereignty led to policies that resulted in the creation of state monopolies and powerful workers' trade unions. For example, the teachers, the oil, and the electric industry were really, really powerful trade unions. And in the, at the end of the 60s and beginning of the 70s, we had the nuclear industry trade union that just didn't last not even 10 years. It really disappeared. And well, but they are very, very powerful, and that's important to know, and also, there was this policy that the transfer of science and technology, as was said in development theories, uh, was, was a way we should get out, out um, and stand and begin our development. And also, this shaped out how we interpreted in Mexico local modes of what it meant to be nuclear. And also, there was this creation of expert bodies and national institutions. All this took place during the 40s and 50s in Mexico. Once again, this is Man Controller of the University, another mural painting of Diego Rivera that is in New York. Actually, Rockefeller asked Diego Rivera to paint it in New York. And well, you see in the middle is this, the atom will free us. That's the main idea and it will be around all the murals that we find, mainly at the Ciudad Universitaria, that is the main campus of UNAM. So, how did Mexico involve with the nuclear in general? And we have these different stages we have found. First of all, and I will show you that we have the physicists, and then eventually we have this supposedly nuclear program engaged to having a nuclear power reactor, and they will, in some sense, they will go in different ways. So at the beginning, in 1950, there was this acquisition of a thundergraph generator. There was the new, the new NAM was, was going to be built at the south of Mexico City. I will show you in a moment a picture, but it was a really prog huge project of modernization and, and of development. So the, the government invested a lot of money and the first thing they did was to build the main science building, okay? So that's important. And the physicists that were three, they had a lot of power, although they were three, and they convinced the president to buy them a thundergraph generator. And that was the first way of being near to something related to the nuclear. The second moment was the distribution of radioisotopes. The first ones arrived to Mexico in 1949 for industrial uses. In just a, a brief thing, in 1946, the United States released the radioisotopes for being able to give them, in a much more moral economy way, to the different countries around the world. So Mexico was one of the countries, and in 1949 had its first radioisotopes. 
Then in 1954, the courses were teach the first courses on radioisotopes at Oak Ridge National Laboratory for international students, and Mexicans started to attend them. And actually, in 1958, four years after, they began to teach to other people techniques on radioisotopes. Then was the Geneva Conference on Atomic Energy in 1955, and Mexican experts assisted. In 1956, like in every part of the world, there was this creation of the National Energy Nuclear Commission. The Mexican one is Comisión Mexicana de Energía Nuclear. Yes, and they had these projects of having radiochemistry, agriculture, genetics, nuclear physics. In 1957, the IAA was created, and as part of continuing to engage these so-called underdeveloped countries into the uses of nuclear materials, in 1961, there was a bus. I will talk to you about this with much more detail. In 1961, the IAA organized a radioisotope bus exhibition around different countries in the world. One went to Latin America, and the other went to countries in Asia, uh, one country in Africa, and Greece. Okay? And finally, in, at the end of the 60s, Mexico was the main promoter of the Tlatelolco Treaty on Latin America as a free zone of the uses of nuclear weapons. So these are the different moments in which Mexico became engaged in different ways to the nuclear. So, the three different senses of the nuclear in Mexico had to do with the instruments in academic and governmental context, okay? That has to do with the UNAM and the Van de Graaff, and the Comisión Nacional de Energía Nuclear that eventually got a trigger mark three nuclear reactor with materials, say uranium reserves, although we never did mine, but there were the uranium reserves in paper and radioisotopes, and also denuclearization and pacifism as a way of being nuclear, okay? So, Edna and I have been thinking about this, and of course, to move nuclear technologies, you need someone to buy them and to use them. So you have to create the need for them. The nuclear te technologies have no teleology inside them, so it's not that they are there and then you use them. You have to make people want them. So the creation of the need for the Mexican case was, of course, a definite moment was 1950 and 1951 when the Graaff accelerator was bought. And I can tell you that although the government was convinced to buy the accelerator, when the accelerator arrived to Mexico, physicists didn't know nuclear physics. So they had to learn what to do with this new instrument that was not part of a bigger project. So they, they had to manage how to work out this new instrument and how to become nuclear at that point. So it's interesting, at the end, this uh, Van der Graaff, it's still working. They still work making some polymers and things like that. And this accelerator triggered, as I was saying, the creation of, of this small seed community of nuclear scientists and experts hooked on the dynamics of development and the further need for a nuclear research reactor. So the need implies that you will begin with this mundane technologies, and afterwards, you will want more technologies. It doesn't happen that way ever, but, but anyway, it was supposed to have this path, and the final idea was that everybody should have at least one nuclear power reactor for energy production. So, the radioisotope, the accelerator, and the third moment was Eisenhower's Atom for Peace Initiative that get in, in movement after his speech. He delivered his speech at the end of the 1953, the 7th of December at the United Nations. And very quickly, in 1954, this nuclear market began. Okay, so 
this is another important moment for nuclear technologies to move around the world. And in 1954, Mexico engaged in what was going to be his hugest project related to the nuclear, to acquire a research nuclear reactor named Trigamas 3 that they were going to buy and they were going to be a, build a special center and they were going to buy it to the U.S., but they never wanted to buy it directly to the U.S., actually, but at the end it happened, the IEA was in the middle of it. And this project included the training of young nuclear engineers and physicists in the USA, mainly the MIT, the Phoenix Memorial Project, which I already talked to you about, and Rice University. So, where does this things happen? This is the UNAM campus in 1954, okay? Here was located the Fander Graph Accelerator, in this, exactly in this building. Now it's the odontology faculty, actually, and, and ray, x-rays at the faculty are done inside that building because it remains really, really safe to avoid radiation. This was called the Radiation Garden. This was a, co a cosmic ray station for Manuel Sandoval Vallarta, and now it's called the, the T, <laughs> because it's near to the odontology faculty. This is the Van der Graaff Accelerator, uh, where, how it was organized at, inside the building. And, well, you can see it's a very small um, generator. It's a two meter generator. Actually, it's not more than two, two and a half meters tall. This is exactly where they control the, the thunder graph. As you see, I, this picture is very nice also because the two boys are looking at this huge machine that nobody understands what it's doing anyway. But well, it still remains the same, actually. It's, it's incredible how they, they still use it. And well, of course, everything has been rearranged in many ways, but it stands almost the same way. And the importance of this standard graph as, and of this engagement to the nuclear can be seen in this beautiful mural from Jose Chavez Morado that he painted all around the university when they built it. All these mural painters made paints about science and the Mexicans. And this mural, it's very interesting, it's named Science and Work. And it begins with the indigenous people that are thrown away from the land, okay, where the UNAM is going to be built. Then you have the same people working to build, to make the infrastructure of the new university. You have the engineers, okay, the architects. And at the end, you have the Thunder Graph Accelerator as this wonderful achievement of science at the university. It's the only mural where, where we have an instrument, I mean, a physics instrument painted. I mean, it's, it's not very big actually, and, well, but it really represents what meant modernization at that moment in Mexico. So, radioisotopes. When I was telling you that there was this different stages of how we got involved. Although the first radioisotopes had arrived to Mexico in 1949, in 1956, the United Nations organized a huge network to take measurements of fallout. Why they took these measurements? Because they wanted to know where were taking atomic bomb tests and how did they move around the world. So Mexico got engaged in it because we already have this six physicists that knew some nuclear physics and they had already attended the Oak Ridge radioactive courses. And here is this photograph of how they made these measurements. And what is, is very interesting is that for making fallout measurements, you really don't need a huge instrument. They used this paper that has wax 
and they put it on the ceiling and they left it for one or two days and after a while they make radiochemistry on it, they, they distillate it and they found radioisotope traces. Okay, so it, in many senses this is a very mundane technology that can be done almost anywhere. So that's one of the main reasons also we got engaged, okay, because it was not extensive and it was really easy. For example, we don't have many documents, but we, we have many photographs that tell us about of material culture and how work was done, actually. This is how they, they used to rearrange the, this wax paper, and this is the places in Mexico where they put these papers, okay? This is the radioisotope courses teach in Mexico in 1958. Women making working with radioisotopes at the UNAM. That's another topic. Women were really, really engaged into radiochemistry. Not in physics, but yes, in radiochemistry. Most of the people were women. That's a, a, a very interesting point. Then, the mobile radioisotope exhibition. As I already told you, in 1959, the, actually the United States donated to the IAA two buses that were already uh, prepared to take these mobile radioisotope exhibitions. Inside of them, there were, there were different instruments, so they could be able to make some kind of experiments, very easy experiments. And there was two drivers, one of them was over Meyer, that is the one that came to Latin America, and the other driver, hopeful, that went to Asia and Ghana, okay? So, you can see the truck. It's a harvester truck, and it's important just to say that this truck can move very easily in the United States. It's very big, and, and that's all, but when it goes to another place that doesn't have the same infrastructure, it has problems, okay? So this is one of the things that, of the, the idea that has to do a lot uh, on what development means when it's designed, for example, by the US and they think that everybody will have the same infrastructure, everybody will know the same thing about radioisotopes or about what, whatsoever, and the reality is quite different, okay? But Obermeyer was very interesting. He wrote letters to the IAEA during all his journey around Latin America. This is one of the photographs we found about the IAEA. They are welcoming this in Korea. We don't have one lovely picture like this for Latin America. And they are receiving this beautiful technical assistance mission that is the bus, okay? So, the bus was not for granted, I mean, not, not the people wanted it for granted. So, Sterling Cole sent to all the IAA members this invitation letter telling them that they had this beautiful radioisotope mobile exhibition, that who wanted it? So, the answers were not as they expected. Most of the countries said, no, thank you. We don't need it. We don't want it. We have never thought about having anything related to the nuclear, so why should we want this? So, Mexico said, it is not necessary to make use of the MRE, since we already have trained experts on radioisotopes. So, who, who do you think we are? I mean, at the end, they changed because they, they thought how to use it in another way. But NIT said, we are not an industrialized country. And we have not even envisaged the necessity of nuclear energy as yet. So, actually at the IAA, they really didn't know what to do to engage countries to accept this radioactive exhibition. For example, to India did not come the radioactive exhibition. The Indian government said, of course, we don't need it. I mean, we, we know much more than you want to show us with that. So here's the day 
they decided to set in movement this IAA exhibition. Okay, so to Latin America, I will show you. It came to six countries. At the end, Mexico said, okay, we will make use of the radio isotope exhibition so we can go to different places in Mexico just to, to make sure that people know that we have a National Energy Commission at the center of the, of the country and to engage ma mainly people related to medical sciences to learn how to, to do some kind of uses of radioisotopes. So, the bus left from Oak Ridge, Overmeyer flew from Vienna to the United States and he drove from Oak Ridge to Mexico. Then he went to Mexico. Then, of course, another main topic. How to move in Latin America the, the truck? There, are, there were no enough roads. So how to do it? Well, by ship, okay? So we didn't have ship routes very well organized actually. So he had to go back to the United States in a ship, okay, to New Orleans, and then it moved, it moved, okay, it arrived to Brazil, then it went to Argentina, okay, then it went to Uruguay, once again it went to Brazil, it went to Bolivia, it went back to Brazil, now I will tell you, and finally it was donated to Costa Rica for the fruit fly uh, experiment, okay? But as we will see, it was not an easy trip. It took five years. And in the meanwhile, they actually, Obermeyer didn't know where he was going to because the country said, no, we don't want it anymore. Now many, many we will want it, now maybe we won't want it. Actually in Brazil, it was very, very complicated. So. This is the truck in Guanajuato, one of the cities in the center of Mexico. And this is Joseph Obermeyer, the driver that sent all these beautiful letters. This is a Mexican physicist named Eugenio Leico. Okay. This is William Pope that was a technician from Oak Ridge that went with the bus but only stayed in Mexico. Afterwards, all the other countries said, we don't need a technician, why should we want a technician? and he went back to Oak Ridge. And this is Armando Lopez, another physicist from Guanajuato. But it's important to notice that the photographs taken in Mexico, they are all at the IAEA, are taken by the government of Mexico. The photograph is not a photographer from, it's not, it's not a spontaneous photograph. Yes, it, we have been thinking about it, but a lot about, about it, but you will see the difference between the photographs taken by Overmeyer and the photographs taken by the government. So, here is the inside of the radioisotope mobile exhibition. There, as you see, they are making, there are students and they are working with these instruments. They are making experiments with the Geiger Mueller. This is the same truck in Bolivia with students. It's just to see how they were trying also to make standardized practices, okay? And to standardize, you need to move things all around the world. So here they are in Bolivia, the students. This is the truck moving in one of the roads in Mexico and it's very interesting, you will see all the time, there is this idea that modernization has to be in contrast all the time with tradition and all ways of doing things. So we have this photograph and there you have, we are very religious, Catholic, and we have the super modern bus driving just near that old thing, okay? This photograph, <laughs> this photograph has been one of the discussions actually we, we have had with one of the archivists at the IAA with um, Leopold Kamerhofer, and if it was organized or not. 
sometimes we say yes and so, sometimes we say no. <laughs> but the idea once again is to see we still use mules and look, we have this mobile radio isotope standing just beside it. This is Brazil and once again, although this is a photograph taken by Overmeyer, but you see there is always, now we are taking these radio isotopes and where we are taking it to and the contrast between the places. This is Bolivia, loading, uploading the truck in Uruguay. It was a mess. Actually, all the time, Obermeyer complains a lot of how things have to be improvised and how, from his point of view, the time goes in a different way all around the trip. And that the movement of the truck is is very is lots of contingencies and lumps during the the itinerary. So I mean, it's just the way things are done when you go to the local places. I mean, you have to things are different. So at some point, over Meyer was really I think he thought a lot about what he was doing, and he wrote back to the IAA headquarters and said, I don't know if, I don't really think actually that these people need what we're bringing with us. So, I mean, in many senses, he was really right. So. Here goes the mobile on the bus, on the bus, yes, but <laughs> on the ship, the Capalma. Actually, the photographs didn't have the, what was, where, where was taken the photograph, so we really made a very, very careful search in trying to find out the places where he would describe and see if he had to do something with, with Uruguay or Brazil. Actually, you know that the ships, all of the ships around the world have a history, and there is this ar huge archive with the names of the boats of the ships and where they have been used and who have bought them and how they have moved. So it's very interesting to make a history of movement of ships and merchandise, for example. You can trace many things looking at that kind of, of archive. Here they are trying to load it on the train and it was a mess. Here once again you have this radioisotope, nuclear energy, and you have the shells with gasoline. How is moved the train? With wood. So all the time, all the time, you have contrast. The mountains in Bolivia. When Obermeyer arrived at the end of the trip to Bolivia, he couldn't move from Cochabamba to La Paz because the bus didn't fit the road. So actually, he, he gets to a point where he had to just come back this way in reverse because he couldn't continue, okay? So the bus was not for that kind of road. Anyway, things happened. He took the instruments and he went by bus, another bus, and he took the instruments with him to La Paz and then the, the radio access courses were teach. Okay. So, after this middle radio isotope exhibition, as, as, I, all, as I already told you, there was this idea of the Comisión Nacional de Energía Nuclear to buy this trigger mark that I already told you, okay? So, here we have a two separate stories. We have the physicists engaged with the Thundergraph and learning radioisotope techniques. They were also engaged in the radioisotope exhibition during its trip to Mexico. And when the Mexican physicists and engineers went to an arbor in Michigan, they were trained as nuclear engineers. So at that point, there was this bifurcation between the physicist and the nuclear engineer. And when I tell you that we sent people, there were a total group of 11 persons, 
that studies nuclear engineering at the Phoenix Project. And when they return back, they engage to this nuclear project, okay? So, at this point, Mexico is engaged into the nuclear in two different ways. One that I could call a more academic way of making nuclear physics, and the other one that really had a project to use this trigamar reactor and eventually buy this nuclear power reactor for producing energy. Okay, so in 1964, Mexico bought this trigamar reactor and they built this new national nuclear center named Salafa that it, it still continues. And in 1968, they set in use this trigamar three with this nuclear engineers. They were all engaged with development and modernization and, well, they were really enthusiastic about it. But at the end, I think I'll go a little bit quicker, this is the ceremony of the beginning of the Salazar Center. There you find Sandoval Barriata, from which I told you something. This is the nuclear Salazar Center in from the Earth, here is located the trigger mass 3. They bought a tandem for the physicists. That is when it arrived. This is the trigger mass 3 reactor. This is, once again, the shield of the trigger mass 3 reactor. The day the, the criticity was, was obtained at the Salazar Center, What happened? Well, in 1960, there was this new president of Mexico named Adolfo Lopez Mateo. Here was with Kennedy, with Lyndon Johnson. And when he arrived to the presidency, he really, really thought that Mexico shouldn't spend money on expensive toys. And when he said that, he was thinking mainly of getting engaged in nuclear technologies and in, uh, in having a nuclear power reactor, okay? So actually he nationalized all the power company of producing, for producing electricity, it became a national uh, state industry and he promoted, he began to promote what was later called the the Tlatelolco Treaty of Free Zone of Nuclear Weapons, okay? So, this policy was interpreted in many ways by the government and the financing of nuclear physics in Mexico as a stopping of financing anything related to the nuclear. So, it's not, it not only just in many senses, stop the, the possibility of, of having this nuclear power reactor, but also of making nuclear physics with big instruments, okay? That doesn't mean that they didn't continue doing some type of things, but anyway, it was reinterpreted in this way. This is Alfonso Garcia Robles. Actually, he won the Nobel Prize because he was one of the figures as one of the promoters of this platinum like the Lotto Treaty, yes, that, well, as, as I already told you, it, pro, it prohibits and prevents the testing, use, manufacture, production, or acquisition by any means whatsoever of any nuclear weapon. But what is interesting here is that Mexico positioned itself into the nuclear <coughs> discussions by not being nuclear, okay, but not engaging into having nuclear weapons. So they, they were pacifists in some sense, <laughs> and they were against any, any nuclear weapon. So they could talk to people with nuclear weapons. Yes, so in some sense, this is a way that Edna and I think they had become, Mexico had become engaged into the nuclear also by denuclearization, okay? This is just the free zone of, of the nuclear treaty. And just to end, uh, I have some concluding remarks. 
that of what meant for the Mexicans to be involved into the nuclear during the 50s and 60s. At the beginning was seen as a national project and also as a transnational model for development and modernity. And when I say as a national project, we have this, that the nuclearization was a mode of engaging to the nuclear, yes, because it meant a program of restriction to the peaceful uses of atomic energy, radioisotopes for medicine, agriculture and industry, and production of electricity, and these programs were under complete control of the state. And it, it also meant decisions about which technologies to promote. Hmm? For instance, when they bought the trigger mark, they had this huge discussion if they were to have enriched uranium reactors or natural uranium reactors that had to do a lot with sovereignty because having enriched uranium meant to buy it to the United States. And during the 70s, technopolitical decisions were taken in the context of a struggle between national trade unions and the national government. So as I told you, the trade union of nuclear, of the Nuclear National Commission made, had a big strike in, the, in 1973. So at the end, it was blow out and the National Nuclear Center was reorganized and never, never they had a, another trade union. Okay, I don't know what happened. Uh, okay, <laughs> but we have this. <laughs> and as a transnational model, as I have told you, the discourse of development implies technological and scientific transfer, and this project ignored the local context and the non-deterministic character of technology. And in this context, not nuclearity, the engagement with the nuclear was understood as one of the high points of development during this decade. But tensions and synergies between modernity and nationalism took place restricting the uses of nuclear technologies in Mexico, as I, as I already told you, and pacifists seek to avoid the waste of resources for development in a nuclear weapons race. In a sense, Mexico was transformed into a zone of nuclear apartheid. However, Mexico positioned itself with a body of diplomatic experts on denuclearization. So this is the way I told you they talk to the nuclear as well. Okay. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Anyone else? Um, thank you. That was really illuminating. I was wondering if you could say something about the defense um, situation. I mean, what were the threats, perceived threats, and why was there no public uh, opinion that demanded nuclear weapons within Mexico? An open demanding of the public, you say? No. Um, was, there, was there a perceived def sort of defense situation, a kind of military threat to Mexico at any point? And was, was there no public pressure at all for nuclear weapons, and why no. not? No. Actually, Mexico is it's really different for, from other countries in Latin America and in, in the world. The nuclear was never related to the military, for example. So there was, since after the revolution that took place in Mexico between 1910 and 1920, the militias were just really sent away from central power because they thought that it was not good to have a common government. So militias were really, really, have been aside for all this time, actually. So the nuclear had nothing to do with militias. So in that sense, there was no reason about making nuclear weapons. But also, I think, Mexico, well, we have the U.S. very near, and that's a very important point. In many senses, the U.S. pushed us not to be into nuclear weapons, and, and Mexico got stronger not being into nuclear weapons. So it had a, a position against the U.S. also, not being into okay. nuclear weapons. I mean, it's, it's, a double, it's a double play, but... But I think that that what was happening. That's why it's, it's different. But 
And also we had, I mean, although we were not military and anything, there were seven physicists. And, and it's not uh, a metaphor. It's, it's one important thing to say. We, the community was made of seven people. And in the 60s, there were 14 people. And they were really into much more into an idea of modernity and development than to become a military state. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, I have a question. Uh, would you comment on the change of nuclearization for power generation in Mexico today? Yes. Uh, in what percentage of the overall power generated is from nuclear power plants? Okay, I can tell you very quickly. The, we have one only nuclear power plant that was uh, set in use in 1989 because after this big strike of the trade union of the nuclear groups, there was this idea of having this nuclear power plant and it began to be delayed, delayed, and delayed, and delayed. And actually, we bought a general electric nuclear reactor for this power plant. and. It's in Veracruz, that is one of the most um, green uh, states in the country. And it, it gives 4% of um, electricity in, in Mexico. And we, it's the only one we have, and it's the only one we're going to have. Since we have hydroelectric and geothermics that are much easy to move, and, and I think that they are less expensive, actually. So we never really got engaged with nuclear power. We didn't need it because we had already this huge infrastructure towards hydroelectricity and geothermic whole energy. Bueno. You know, in Mexico, there has been never such a big discussion about science and technology. And at that moment, the nuclear, nobody cared about the nuclear, actually. We didn't even have any kind of popular movement or, and nobody cared about it. So no, no, I mean, the president said that, and actually there was no flow of money. It had been reduced a lot. And when the next president arrived, Diaz Ordaz, um, he also did not invest into nuclear uh, science. So, I, actually, I think that's the point when the Mexicans stopped investing in science and technology in Mexico. We have this point, big, big investment between 1950 and 1960, and then it became just down and down and down and down and until today. Since you mentioned that uh, most of the power in Mexico today comes from geothermal and hydroelectric, uh, do you think that the new, no uh, the new notion of modernity there is now to invest in other more renewable sources of energy production, for instance, uh, solar? Um, no? No, no. In Mexico, they, they have, I mean, they have not tried even to get, go into that kind of, of energy actually. So modernity still remains to have hydroelectric and geothermic, actually. Okay. Very new ones and powerful ones, but not into new types of, of energy production. We are not into that. Actually, right now with the new government, I think that they're planning to get into that as a new way of being modern, but I, I'm not sure. And uh, what is uh, Mexico or the Mexican government's position on climate change? On what? On climate change. climate change. Oh, look, that's very interesting. We, of course, we believe in climate change. I think that's important because if we see and someone like, like Trump that doesn't believe. And by we, you mean the, the, the government in power? Yes. Well, no, I will, uh, that's what I was going to tell you. I, 
we have now a change in, in the government in Mexico, a really, really important change. But the main party that is named the PRI has always signed against anything of, of the production of carbon in the atmosphere and in the Tokyo Protocol, the Brazil Protocol. I mean, but actually how we have done, how we have changed technologies to avoid it, Nothing has happened, but actually we are not a, one of the countries that produces much of it, so it's it's tricky. And the new government, I think they're going to be more engaged in in maybe making new kind of technologies to avoid this, but I'm not sure. I mean, let's see, because we have now one of the the most important Scientist is a woman named Elena Alvarez Buya, and she's really pushy into the use of new technologies. And she has this position of the National Science and Technology Program that gives money to all the projects in science and technology in Mexico. So maybe there will be a change. Hopefully, it will, there will be a change. But. Anybody else? I, mean, I, can, I can always. <laughs> Thank you, Gisela. I mean, this was very, very interesting, and actually, many, uh, many interesting points that came up here. Also, like with the technology, what happens, like with the bots, for example, if you take the technology and try to make it work in some other place, right? I mean, I have a very similar uh, kind of issue. Actually, what I found very interesting, like uh, even though we know each other, we haven't talked about this when. Uh, IIT Madras was set up in in Madras in Chennai, and I guess many here know in the in the uh, in in the audience that it was set up with a German assistance, or some know that it was set up with German assistance. And again, they came there. The German professor came there. They put instruments into crates. They shipped them over to Madras, and they kind of blindly assumed that they would be working the same way as they would be working in Germany, right? And this kind of very blind idea of technology transfer and technology would somehow like kind of perform the same way in a different environment, which means both a different like kind of infrastructure and climatic environment, which was a big problem. You, you bring like an electron microscope, for example, and uh, you have very high electricity fluctuations in the network, but also you, you're in a tropical country and you need to uh, need uh, to act. And, I mean, there's what I'm just wanting to say, like this kind of failure of this kind of very naive idea of technology transfer, which we had in uh, in this period, right? I find very interesting. But then what I also find very interesting is there's also a parallel. If you want to ask why the heck did the Germans go there and set up IIT Madras, right? Like why did they help to set up IIT Madras? And I had all kinds of theories. And then you go to the archive and you try to find out. And at the end of the day, it's Cold War politics, nothing but Cold War politics. It's about West Germany trying to do Cold War politics in India. Mm -hmm. And that's why they come and help to set up the institution, right? Like, and you also wonder why the heck did they send up and over my wondering, what am I doing here, right? And you say at the end of it, uh, is it only political? I don't know, right? Is it politics? It's doing, is it doing politics with science? Yes, of course, it has to do a lot of politics with science. For example, the United States was really trying to avoid communists to arise in Latin America. And we have this coup d'etat in Latin America beginning in 1954 in Guatemala as part of this avoiding the communism to arise. And the movement of this but was part of it. Of course it is. It has a lot to do. But at the same time, and I, that's what I find also interesting, is that local communities make use of it in many different ways for many different things. Not the way it was used to be, but in local things. So they learn to use radioisotopes. For some communities, for, for Mexico, it was just this way of saying, okay, look, we have this National Commission Nacional de Energía Nuclear, okay? And so you always have the different uses of the same thing, and of course, there's no teleology, teleology inside of it. 
although it's written in the paper and it has political intentions, I don't think that the radioactive of exhibition mobile avoid communism arriving. Yeah, yeah. That's For right. example, it, it, at, at the end, that didn't happen. <laughs> I mean, communism arrived in other ways. <laughs> and also maybe because people used, <laughs> knew how to use radioisotopes. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of tension when you have this technical assistance program being, being set in use in the places. There are many interests, many agents that are around them, and I think people find many ways to, to get good things and bad things of them. And I wanted to say just one thing, now you have used the tropical, to bring to the tropical this technologies. At the IAEA in the 1960s, they were talking about this, we have to learn how to make nuclear tropical technologies. And they use the word tropical to refer to them because they, how could they work out if you had 40 centigrade, for example? Huh? Or if there was going to be also this idea of very tropical people using them or that the high voltage would n n not be even all the day set, for example, the current, you wouldn't have current all day, so it's, it's interesting. And they reshaped and reshaped also how they, they had to set in use and, set, and put in movement these technical assistance programs. So. Last question? Okay. If not, let's uh, thank you, Phil, again. Thank you. This concludes uh, part one of the December Double Bill. There is another talk tomorrow at the same time by Ulas Karan, titled Recovering Nature in Crowded India. Please do join us for that. And uh, do join us for tea outside. Thanks so much.